Hey, everybody out there. This is The Fall Line with KS and Company, and we have an absolutely amazing podcast for you. Um, I'm Dave Caper, and I'm here with Angela Ross, and we are here with Wayne Wong, absolutely the father of freestyle skiing, sometimes called the godfather of freestyle skiing. Wayne, thanks so much for being here with us. Hey, I'm glad to be able to get on board and talk with you guys today. Yeah, this is this has been Angelo's dream podcast, and he did not think it was going to come <laughs> this fast for us. And uh, so I, I know he probably has a couple of things to stay, say when we get going here. What's going on, Angelo? Oh, super excited. You know, yeah. um, I don't know. I, I look back on. Uh, I'll tell you what. Something jumps in the mind. We we used when I was a kid, we would go to Seven Springs Resort on a school bus, and this was in the um, this was in the eighties. But we would do these rat races down this hill called Boomerang, and we would just absolutely destroy each other trying to get down the uh, down, down the hill. For a patrol, love that. But the winner would always bust out a big worm turn, worm turn at the bottom, and we would say, "Like Wayne Wong, man, and here he is." Thanks for coming on. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can get a demo a couple times out there at Seven Springs. That was a fun place. Well, yeah. And, yeah, and you're always welcome back. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was talking to someone today from uh, Neshoba Valley because uh, they were they were up doing a race event up at Bretton Woods and they said that you come to Neshoba all the time. You know, I've had this relationship with the Neshoba Valley for over, well, almost 50 years. And uh, a brief background on that is uh, in 1972, uh, at, one, at one of our freestyle competitions of Aguario Valley, the owner of, of Neshoba Valley at that time was Al Fletcher Sr. And he had come up to see what this freestyle stuff was all about. And uh, I met him there and we hit it off and, you know, we became friends. And he said, you know what? I have this tiny little ski area down there in Western Mass. I'd love for you to come down and do a demo. So that was in 1972, I believe. And I came down there, and all he had were rope toes at that time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they had a mass uh, crowd. They have promoted that I was going to be there on that one evening. And there was about 500 people there at the base area waiting for me to show up on the hill and perform. And uh, I remember they had um, – it's just a small slope, and so they didn't really have it a lot of natural terrain. And so what they did was they put the snow guns and they uh, positioned them so that there was these huge Volkswagen type moguls. I mean, they were like six and seven feet tall all the way down the hill. So if you got behind one of them, you couldn't see me coming up from up behind it if you're down below. But so this was this, this man-made mogul field with six foot high moguls down this, uh, the cheek that uh, the show book valley it, it was great fun and then oh. off the side we had a little area where i could do all my ballet and stuff so yeah. that, that was so that was the start of it and uh i've been going back there almost every year for about five days at a time just to ski with the kids ski with the locals ski with the ski school you know anybody that lived nearby that wanted to come and ski with me and unfortunately last year with with covid was one of the first years that I hadn't been back there in almost 50 years. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's like a second home to me. And the yeah. folks in the Shola Valley are like my family. Yeah. That's awesome. That's that cool to do that for so long. And, and I, I want to go back though and start at the beginning. Cause this is a question that, that I found I, I, that folks tell me that they really love from the podcast. We always ask our guests, when did you first learn? Um, I know it was up in Canada in uh, Vancouver, Vancouver, British Columbia, but like, did you learn from family? Did you take a lesson? I mean, how did it start for Wayne Wall okay. putting on a pair of skis? All right. So I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And at that time, there was two local ski hills that came right out of the city. One was Grouse Mountain and the other one was Mount Seymour. And uh, a good friend of mine, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, would go skiing with his family to Mount Baker in Washington. And he'd come back uh, Monday and just tell me how, how, what a blast he had skiing. And it was really a great sport. And he said, you really should try it. So that year I signed up for a uh, Parks and Recreation Ski Program 
Uh, it was eight weeks of lessons, and we had a bus ride and rental skis and ski lessons. And it was all a whole 36 bucks for, <laughs> for the late <laughs> sessions. And so um, I signed up for that. And um, in my first day on the hill was uh, not a great, well, first couple hours, I should say, it was not a great experience because I, the bus arrived there about uh, nine, or nine, 9 o'clock and the lessons worked till about 10. So I had about an hour to try to figure out you know, how to make these things work, these big long sticks. And uh, I remember uh, distinctly going down this little tiny beginner hill where, it, you know, you can just slide down and not worry about stopping or anything. But I had no idea how to get back up. And I said, well, that's easy. I'll just take these skis off, off and I'll walk up. <laughs> well, little did I know that when I took these skis off, I sunk down immediately chest deep in the snow because we didn't have packing or grooming or any of that type, kind of stuff at that point. So anyhow, I, I started to cry because <laughs> I was stuck and nobody was out. Nobody was around me. <laughs> but I was able to kind of crawl, you know, like out of quicksand and back up on the mm. on a little harder pack. But anyways, I got, uh, that's how my first hour or so, but once I got back up and got into my ski lesson, I was hooked. I was hooked on the sport. I, I loved it right from the get go there. So that's the, 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 the ski hill itself at that time wasn't really a large mound. It, you know, we had rope toes basically and about 200 vertical. And so it was up and down, up and down, up and down. And there really wasn't a lot of terrain uh, to really challenge my you know, skills at that time. So back in about 1965-ish, uh, the Hart Ski Company uh, had their hard demo team and they had like uh, Susie Chaffee oh, yeah. and uh, Roger Staub and uh, you know numerous other uh, Art Fuhrer doing tricks on skis and I was absolutely mesmerized by what I had seen. I said, holy cow, this is so cool. And so what happened was I started to try to do these tricks on my own. And that in the late in the sixties, there was nobody coaching or teaching. Nobody even knew what it was. But uh, what I had seen in these heart movies, I was like, "Oh man, I want to try this." So I would try to do these Royal Christies and crossovers and stuff. And I'd actually fall and spin around and land back up on my feet again. And I go, "Wow, that's pretty cool." And then later on, I'd get together with my buddies. I say, "Hey, look at this trick I just learned." So I started playing around, and my friends and I kind of. Edge, edge each other on to you know try to do one better than each other and uh so during that time frame i started to invent tricks that nobody had ever seen before or you know uh, never done before and it purely came out by accident and uh, so i started to build up a repertoire of um tricks and you know naming them you know with my namesake just for fun uh, and everybody asked me about the wong banger, and yeah. I'll explain it to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the wong banger, um, it, it was a trick that I invented uh, purely by accident. And what it was, was I was skiing down uh, this little slope, had a very sharp uh, um, a transition train like a wall. And I hit, I hit it with my ski tips, and it started to flip me forward. And uh, instinctively, I stuck my poles out in front of me and flipped and landed back on my feet again. And I go, wow, that's like doing a somersault, you know, without a jump, but running into a wall and banging into a wall. And, and, and during the, at that time, one of, you know, one of the infamous drinks was the Harvey Wall Banger. Some people may know it, may not, but anyhow, I said, this would be great. I'm going to call this trick the, you know, the Harvey Wall Wong Banger. <laughs> so it became, became the, you know, we, I ended up really just call it the Wong Banger because I banged into this wall and it flipped me over forward. I flipped over using my poles and landed on, on my feet again. So that was really kind of the first pole flip that I'd ever done or seen. And believe it or not, there was a 200 centimeter skis at that time. 
So that, that's quite a feat in itself, you know, to be able to project yourself on 200 centimeters as suppo- opposed to when we were doing it in competition on 135s and 150s, which made it a lot simpler. But back in the very beginning, I was doing it on 200 centimeter skis. So that was one of the tricks that became my namesake. And the other one was, uh, I called it the long mill. And uh, I had watched uh, Art Fuhrer and a couple of these guys do a tip roll on skis. And I go, wow, that's pretty cool. And so uh, the first time I did it, I, you know, I kind of tried to analyze it. And the first time I did it, I threw everything that I had into it to try to make sure I didn't get hung up halfway through the trick. And I ended up doing a 540 spin over my ski poles and, 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 in a tip roll fashion. And uh, it became a 540 aerial side, sideways aerial tip roll, which uh, looked like a windmill. So I ended up calling it the long mill. And I introduced <laughs> those two tricks at the very first competition at Waterville Valley in 1971. So yeah. those are some of the you know backgrounds to how I started doing uh, tricks and inventing tricks and uh, tricks that became my namesake. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a little bit about, I know Waterville was the like first, because it was considered, I think an exhibition, but it was like the first competition. I mean, what sure. were some of the like criteria? Did, did you guys know is the hot doggers coming in? Cause then it was more of the hot doggers. Did you, sure. did they give you criteria? Did you know what it was going to take to win? Or you just said, Hey, I'm doing my tricks. <laughs> okay. That, that is a great question. And it is really kind of sums up, what this whole sport, how it all began. So I'll back up a little bit. Uh, at that time, um, the editor of chief of skiing magazine was a guy named Doug Pfeiffer, who was a PSIA guy and you know, or a ski writer, etc. And he was at a ski function dinner with Tommy Corcoran, who had just come off the U.S. ski team, uh, a medalist, and also the developer of Waterville Valley. So they had this conversation uh, at this dinner at who was the best skier on the mountain. And uh, Tommy Corcoran responded to me, well, obviously it's the ski racers. You know, they're more disciplined. They can, you know, they're the best skiers on the mountain. And Doug Pfeiffer being a rebel that he was in in those days uh, said, you know, Tommy, I beg to differ. What about these guys that are doing flips on the skis? What about these guys that are banging down the mogul field? And uh, he says, you know what, Tom, you're building Waterville Valley. It's a brand new ski area. Let's host a competition to really see who the best skier on the mountain is. And um, so they said, yeah, let's do that. So that was in March of 1971. And uh, it was called the National Championships of Exhibition Skiing. It wasn't called freestyle skiing or hot dogging. It was the National Championships of Exhibition Ski. And um, so I had seen the advertisement for this in uh, Skiing Magazine. And my buddies that I skied with back home locally said, Hey, Wayne, you really got to go to this because you've got tricks that nobody had ever seen before. And so they helped me raise some money to, to help, you know, pay for my expenses to fly from Vancouver and get transportation and get all the way back to Waterville Valley. And uh, that in itself is another story. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But the the long and the short of it, the competition format was on a run called True Grit. Quite Mm -hmm. long, about, uh, I would say about 200 yards or so. Yeah, about 200 yards long. And it's very steep on the top. Big rolls in the middle part and just kind of gentle uh, rolls down to the bottom of the, of the slope itself. So the format was um, the best two out of three runs to count. And they had uh, five judges, and Jean-Claude Keeley was a judge at that event. They've got Jean-Claude to come in for that. They also got um, Chevrolet to come up with as a sponsor. And they gave away a, a brand new Chevrolet Corvette, and it, which was became part of the ten thousand dollars in prize money. Well, I signed up not because of the money or anything, but I wanted to come to this event and um, 
show people what could be done on skis, uh, like the wall banger and the windmill and wall mill and stuff like that. So anyhow, so this is a format of the best two out of three uh, runs uh, would count as your score. And there was about 45 competitors. Susie Chaffee was there. Uh, Bill Peterson, um, Tommy Leroy, Herman Golner. These guys I had watched in all the heart movies. Uh, if you go back to Ski the Outer Limits and stuff like that, you would see a movie uh, with Tommy Leroy and Herman Golner doing front and back flips and also doing flips into Corbett's Cool War in Jackson. And I remember distinctly that these guys were heroes of mine. These were the guys I wanted to emulate, as well as you know, guys like Stein Erickson, of course. Um, but anyhow, the, they, the, here are these guys that, uh, for me, as a kid out of nowhere, walk around in the same day lodge with my skiing icon heroes was a the best thing since sliced bread. Anyways, I didn't even want, I didn't even care about skiing. Just to hang out with my people that I'd seen in, in the movies was, was reward enough. But anyhow, so the, the event went on and, um, uh, it, and what had happened was the biggest fear of my life was coming from the West Coast, the East Coast. We heard about the ice, the, <laughs> the icy conditions. Uh, that they had on the East Coast. And the first day that I got there, it wasn't bad conditions, but then it started to snow the next day, and then it changed the rain, and then it dropped to 20 below, all in about 12 hours. So the next day when I got up on the hill, it was exactly what I had dreaded and heard about was the ice. I had never seen anything like that in my entire life. It was glazed. The hill that we were <laughs> being on True Grit was glazed. And the best way that I could describe it is put a, a skating rink at about a 35 degree slope, 35 degree angle. And that was what we we're looking at to ski on and compete against, compete on. And I was absolutely freaked out by that. But anyhow, uh, part of the Wayne Wong story is this, this, this truly happened to me. So, uh, I, on my first run, uh, I planned to unleash the Wong banger, um, on the third mogul, the steepest part of the, the hill. And I distinctly remember making three turns on the starting gate and I went out to flip and I missed and I fell and I just, and I just landed on my butt and I go, Oh man, I came 3000 miles to fall after the third mogul. No, oh, so I was really kind of bummed out. Anyways, I skied down the, the moguls and down through some of the jumps and the rolls. And, uh, I ended up, oh, you know, in the middle of the pack or, you know, somehow, but on the second run, I had a half decent run and, uh, I was, um, sitting there, uh, in pretty good shape, and uh, on the third and final run, I, I ski down the mogul part, and then in the big rolls and, and the and the jumps were planned in the middle. As I took off this one jump, one of my skis pre-released. As I took off, I left one ski on the on the jump, and here I am about fifteen twenty five feet in the air on one ski. And I, I land perfectly on the one ski, and I end up doing all these spins and twirls on one ski all the way through the finish area, and people loved it. They thought I had planned their, you know, this, this whole hot dog, whole freestyle thing. You know, I had planned to take my skis off, you know, uh, part of my routine. But, uh, <laughs> anyhow, I ended up skiing down to the finish area, and I, I, I took third place overall. Um, I didn't win the event, but I was third. That was enough to kind of launch my career and actually help launch the the movement of freestyle skiing. Yeah, yeah I mean, what was it? Um, I mean, what happened after that? Like, how did you get connected to some other things that really launched it? There was there okay, a meeting. With so, yeah, I was very fortunate that uh, Doug Fiker really kind of saw had a vision of the sport where he wanted to see it go. And, you know, he realized the, uh, uh, what, what it could bring to the sport of skiing itself. 
And so I was invited by Doug to come out to Mammoth Mountain in the springtime to be a ski tester. So, man, to me, that would be great. Get out and ski on all the next 1972 skis ahead of everybody else. So I ended up going to Mammoth and um, started uh, testing skis for them. And uh, what happened there, again, this is a, for me, it was, I've was been very fortunate in my skiing career to be at the right place at the right time. So what happened was well, during the time that I was uh, ski testing, this ad agency came up from L.A. to shoot a Pepsi-Cola commercial. And so they were walking around the lodge just asking people, you know, they wanted to come out and try out and ski for the camera to be on chair three at, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock. I can't remember. But so and a couple of guys that I was hanging out with said, hey, wait, let's go up and do that. And I said, sure. OK, so we go up there. So I started down there and I'm doing all my freestyle stuff. They had never seen anything like that. And uh, they filmed you know, a whole bunch of us doing stuff, but they like me in particular, I guess, but I didn't know. And uh, so that following fall, in the fall of 71, 72, I believe, uh, I was featured in the Pepsi-Cola commercial. And uh, here at the very end of the commercial itself, I do a helicopter and I land in an outrigger position and uh, the Pepsi Cola logo is flashed over, over the screen over my image. So every kid who was in skiing and freestyle skiing, I had so many people come up to me that saw that commercial. They still remember to this day, they still remember that commercial, but that I know influenced a lot of young kids to want to become a freestyle skier. I had, hundreds of kids that had seen this and had come to some of my camps and wanted to learn what I had done there. And I said, the only thing is if I teach you any of that, if you ever beat me in, in any of these competitions, you owe me a dinner. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and yeah. it's neat. You went from, you know, 71 kind of launching there at that exhibition and then, in 1975, which this is a part that I really want to know about that um, is kind of Angelo's in my world is the ski instruction world with PSIA is um, you went with your Canadian uh, demo team to Interski. And, and how, yeah. how did that relationship come and, and have you somewhat stayed connected to ski instruction over the years? Yes. Uh, OK, so uh, when I was growing up again locally, uh, you know, we had two options you could, to ski for free. <laughs> one was being a ski patrolman or one was to become a ski instructor. So in, when I was 16 in 1966, I took my first Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance course in Banff, Alberta. And I, was, I got certified as a ski instructor at that time of what we call a level two. And over the next three years, I went and uh, did all my certifications. And I became, I got my highest certification uh, in 1970, 1971, which was a level four senior uh, 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 alliance member. And uh, so, uh, so I went through the whole, you know, whole uh, certification route with, with uh, the CSIA. And in 1975, uh, they asked me to be part of the inner ski team to um, uh, demonstrate freestyle skiing to the World Ski Congress. And we went to uh, 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 Czechoslovakia. And uh, I remember uh, going there. And while the team was doing the, you know, the, the Christie's and the parallel and, and all that stuff, I would lead the team down doing crossovers, Royal Christie's and, uh, uh, you know, 360s and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I really became kind of the, the, the quote, star of, the, of our demo because I was a lead skier in the demonstration. Though I didn't really demonstrate the Canadian technique at that time, but I introduced uh, freestyle skiing to the world as part of the Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance. So that that was uh, in 1975. Um, I, I've been very much, I have not taught skiing in an official capacity. I, uh, I still 
take uh, take clients out and ski. I, I've done ski camps, uh, I've done corporate ski outings, and I, I try to stay involved. I have a lot of friends uh, uh, who are members of PSIA, and I talk to them. I ski with them, and I you know I try to see what's up and coming or what's doing, what's going on, new in technique and um, things like that to to really better my own skiing. And um, part of my ski career, I guess, is during the freestyle things, um, freestyle years, I really wanted to, you know, improve my technical skiing. So I guess over the last 30 years, I've been searching for the perfect turn. You know, every time I go out on the ski slope, I play with different things, different sensation, different movement patterns, to see if I can feel something a little bit different or uh, change something that I'm doing that makes me more efficient. I guess part of the thing now is that um, as I'm getting older, I'm looking to be, you know, how can I achieve the same skills or uh, and be efficient and not work as hard as I ha did when I was younger. And so I'm always looking for you know, little, uh, little subtleties in skiing uh, to see how it would affect my uh, skiing it, itself. And uh, so I've been looking at technological advantages as well mm. as physical and, uh, you know, mechanical advantages. And uh, so, you know, I'm still very much, I'm very interested in ski technique. And yeah. uh, every time I look, look at people skiing, I look at ski instructors and, see what they're doing in teaching. I, I guess um, I've um, kind of come up with my own philosophy that they, there are tricks to the tricks of skiing. Simplicity things that people don't really understand that uh, can make their skiing much simpler and uh, much more efficient, I suppose. And uh, so I've got a whole repertoire of uh, what I would call insiders, insider uh, information on how to do things more efficiently. Things like, um, uh, you know, just one of the things that drives me crazy is, you know, you, you hear people, don't sit back, don't sit back. Well, you have to sit back in order to load the ski at the end of the turn. You stay forward all the time you know that the tails are going to wash out at the end of the turn. So there, there is this movement of forward, center, and aft, constant movement. But I see ski instructors and people teaching people to lean forward, lean forward, lean forward. That's fine at the initiation phase of the turn, but what happens at the finish? So, so things like that, there's little subtleties that I tell people. They say, well, we're not taught not to sit back. And I said, well, Here's the reality of it. You really do need to load that tail of the ski to you know, uh, allow the ski to uh, finish in the arc. And so once I get them to understand those kind of things, um, uh, I think it helps them a lot. And uh, <laughs> Kind of so like the poster. There. The poster back here, you definitely have the tail loaded. <laughs> What's behind that? The, the poster of you behind me definitely has the tail uh, loaded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? That, I'll have to explain that poster to you a little bit. Obviously, it was for K2, and we wanted to highlight yeah. the, the base of the ski and everything like that, the red, white, and blue. And we were just goofing around. So, you know, they said, wait, let, let's go and just shoot some stuff. So I said, okay. So a big part of the deal back in the day, back in the 60s, was, you know, trying to, to do wheelies on the tail of your ski. See how long you could, you know, ride on the tails of your ski without falling backwards. So... This, this particular uh, shot, um, it was set up on a mogul, and I was just trying to get my skis up as high in the air as possible, the tips high up in the air as possible, but keeping the tails on the ground, creating that wheelie look and, you know, and not falling backwards and landing back up on my feet. And so that became the iconic Wong K2 poster shot you know we didn't ski like that all the time <laughs> as a matter of fact we were all in that position uh, uh unexpectedly <laughs> trying to recover for something but for photo shots that you know we we did that just for the photos yeah because i know angelo's got some stuff here he he is a just loves 
or I should say he wants to see style come back into skiing. And, and I think that's why he, he wanted to chat with you so much because of that. Wow. And that you're so technical. Go ahead, Angela. Well, I, yeah, but, you know, I want to back up to the 1975 inner ski for a second, because I think Wayne was being a little humble. He, you were really showcased in that mm-hmm. event. I've seen some video. Um, not only were you in front, um, doing different stuff you your uniform was even different from from everybody else's and what i saw it was and and what i'm curious about is how that was received by the rest of the um by the rest of the skiing world at the inner ski what what kind of vibes did you get from countries that that weren't there with regard to freestyle uh you know um the, the whole freestyle presentation there was nobody else doing that except me representing Canada and being of Chinese, uh, Asian um, descent, uh, they all told everybody that, that I was the Canadian Eskimo on their team. And every country, you know, from around the world, well, Canada, they have Eskimos. So I was the Eskimo on the Canadian team. Um, <laughs> but as far as the uniforms go, uh, you know, we, ha- we were sponsored by pedigree of Canada for the actual official uniforms. But at that time, I had uh, my own sponsorship in clothing. And so I, I wore a, a suit that was kind of complementary to the Canadian team colors. And so there, there was no, no issues about that at all. No problem at all. Um, but uh, I just remember being there and uh, being very proud to present represent Canada, but also the, the up and coming sport of freestyle skiing that I think right, right there, I introduced it to the entire ski Congress of the world. And um, so that, that, that was a good little bonus as well. So, but yeah, to, to sort of piggyback off the point Dave was making, we, we have a real tendency these days, fast forward 50 years, and we're, we're, we can be very analytical about um well everything really you know but when i i look at the poster um that's that's just pure expression you know yeah. um do you, do you when you look around the ski world today or or even throw the snowboard world in there do you do you, do you feel like you see such expression these days where where is it now in the sport i i, I tell you what so you know, as we all know, there's a big change when the shape ski came out around and from the, our conventional skis. And to be honest, right at the very beginning, I thought these shape skis were a gimmick, a trick, because I didn't really understand how they were to be skied on and how they were to be used. Uh, because on the long skis, we had to use a lot of pivot and sliding to get those big skis around. But the shape skis changed the way we stood on and, and uh, maneuvered the skis by getting up onto an edge and really started to use the side cut of the ski. And once I got that figured out, it really changed again uh, for me uh, another level of skiing, the love of skiing for me, because now all of a sudden I had this new sensation uh, of the ski starting to arc and so the ski starting to, to carve and the skis really started to create G-forces. And um, so about then, you know, the, the whole carving segment, I think, uh, unfortunately, went up, what came into Vogue and out of Vogue too quickly. And people really never got uh, a real good handle on the carving experience, the sensation of the skis arcing in a turn. And uh, I call myself a G-Force junkie because I love to get my skis laid over on edge now and just let the side cut take over and create G forces. Uh, uh, That slingshot effect when that ski loads in the arc and unloads out of the turn, uh, it's hard to explain to people the the sensation that you, you get from that. It's a, it's a, a whole different feeling. And for me right now, my favorite thing to do is to get on a long, wide groomer slope, fresh corduroy and arc and lay down. I would rather ski on that than two feet of powder uh, just to get the skis out there and laid out and arcing and carving 
that sensation of laying that ski over and letting it take you for a ride through the side cut is it, it, it's amazing. And I see more and more people finally starting to get out of it, get into it, and they're starting to uh, get away a little bit from the, these fat double tip, you know, twin tip skis, and starting to really try to figure uh, this, the, the carving aspect of it. So what I see right now is that there is a slight coming back. You see more emphasis on front side skis and skis with uh, side cut because people are realizing now that those. A lot of the fatter, wider skis don't arc as well as a ski, a shorter ski with a, a deeper side cut. It's a lot less effort. You can do it on the big, wide you know, skis, but it's a little bit more effort than laying out like a, a little slalom ski over with a deep side cut and just let it arc and bite into the turn. So um, that's what I see in, 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 in transition in skiing right now. And... Uh, and for me, that's where my my biggest thrill in skiing. I, I don't need to jump off the biggest cliff. I don't need to go skiing through the woods. I just need to get my ski slingshotting from turn to turn right now. So um, are <laughs> yeah, no, we're we're just soaking it in. Myself, I was just soaking it in. I was waiting for Angelo because I know he's soaking it in, and um, because it's neat. Your your passion just for skiing. It's it, as I you know did a little research and you know to more than what I already knew just from watching things over my, my lifetime of you. Um, it, it's neat that you're always smiling and very excited about skiing. Um, whether you know and that's why the the ski instruction stuff really intrigued me because I I didn't know that much about you till I started looking into it and, and it's neat that you look into the technical piece and and what the equipment's doing I, uh, that's pretty neat with all the expression that you have in all these years and that's kind of my my question to you when you look at freestyle today with snowboard and um and and alpine um because you know everybody's doing we're doing it on the tele gear um do you see the roots of freestyle in there is it grown to a point it's hard to see the roots or you know, because I, I like ballet, we don't see, but is there still the roots of some of the ballet and things like slope style? You know, uh, it, I, I have to give credit to the young athletes that are competing in freestyle skiing right now, especially the moguls and the aerials. Uh, I got to give them credit. You know, I've watched a couple of World Cup events and the speed and the athleticism that they display is amazing. Uh, I could never do that. Um, so they've taken it to another level, um, you know, and I, 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 I like, I love the fact that, you know, we were the grassroots guys and they've taken it to, you know, to an extreme level where I, I am in absolutely awe because I, even if I was 20 years old, I could never do what these, these you know, World Cup champions and Olympic champions are doing in the moguls these days. You know, the courses are a lot different. Uh, you know, they're, a lot of them are typically man-made and with uh, two jumps in the middle. And, you know, the criteria, uh, we didn't have that kind of criteria where, you know, it was split up into speed, turns, and air, and, and stuff like that. And based on that, the judges, you know, I, I think we're... For me, the hardest part to really get a handle on is the speed element in moguls right now, which is uh, given 25%. And um, so as you guys know, if you deflect the skis in the fall line, come off the fall line, arc, you know, and deflect it, you're going to slow your speed down. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, if you deflect it, you, you know, I appreciate the, the see the ski arc and carve down through the bump. But typically, you know, especially after the last jump, uh, it, there's not a lot of arcing. It's really just kind of maintaining speed and, as fast as you can to get down through the fish area. So my, my only thing was, you know, I would love to see a little bit more, less um, uh, emphasis on the speed element, just because I, personally, I appreciate, you know, the, uh, the arcing ability, uh, the physical uh, turn what it takes to make the ski engage in the mogul itself. Um, so, uh, uh, but I do appreciate the 
how strong these boys and girls are that compete in there and do what they do in the aerials in the uh, mogul field and landing on their feet and doing you know what they're doing. I go, wow. And I go, and I think back, I said, these guys are crazy. And I go back to 1971 and people looking at us, looking at us getting down True Grit or Exhibition at Sun Valley and going, boy, those guys are crazy. <laughs> so it's that whole generation thing that has, you know, you go, wow. And you, you, you learn to appreciate uh, what the new athletes are doing. And, you know, and again, in uh, snowboarding, snowboarding was kind of like, uh, you know, as it came on, like freestyle, it was kind of like a rebel sport, you know, against uh, tradition. But they took it to the next level. And my gosh, what they're doing with snowboarders and, you know, their amplitude, how high they go and their, you know, rodeo 360 cowboy or whatever they do in the air it is it's fantastic. It's, yeah. You know, it's unbelievable. We could never imagine doing that on skis back in the day. And I just remember watching Herman Golner for the first time doing a Mobius flip, which was a full twisting back somersault. How is that possible? <laughs> and now I look at these guys, kids are doing a double back, a double twisting somersault in the moguls. And I go, how is that possible? <laughs> so, you know, it's great. I mean, in, in any way you look at it, it is great. It is really great because it's still part of skiing and, it's, and the sport. You know, I love the fact that it's still evolving. Yeah, it's definitely evolved fast. I mean, go ahead, Angelo. I, well, it, you were talking about arcing, and I wondered if you'd talk about the Powder 8 championships for a little bit. Yep. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, I competed in the World Powder 8 Championships for three years, four years, back in the uh, mid, mid-80s. And I was teamed up with uh, one of the leading skiers in, in Japan. And we were sponsored by a Japanese ski magazine and a Japanese uh, um, sportswear uh, ski company. And uh, so we won uh, won the event three times. And uh, again, at that time, we were skiing on conventional uh, GS skis, you know, like a 200-203 GS ski to ski, you know, try to get some flotation. Well, at, at, towards the last year or so that I competed, um, uh, they started switching out to the fatter skis, which uh, the heli ski operation guys really wanted. They they realized that a ski that would float would be a lot easier for their clients and customers coming in. So they, I know that in Mike Weasley's case, uh, he went to Atomic and had them build those magic powder skis, which was twice as wide uh, as a conventional ski at that time, which gave you a lot more flotation. And because of that, the format of the competition changed because the skis now uh, would float on the top. So you could go a lot faster and you can really make some bigger arcing uh, figure eights. So that was after the last year that I competed. They started skiing. And so the format of the powder race had changed where the, the fatter skis allowed them to make uh, faster, longer, bigger turns and really, really symmetrical shapes in the snow. Whereas with the uh, conventional um, straight skis that we had, the turn shapes were really kind of difficult to try to make them round. It's, it's just hard to get that tail coming around. But that's what we did. Nobody knew any better at that time. And the technique that my partner and I had from Japan, we were fortunate enough to have the style and the line and the technique um, that allowed us to win it three times. And, and what was your training like back then? I mean, was it just going out and skiing? Did you, I mean, I mean, what, what, what was kind of the, the Wayne Wong getting ready for the ski season and getting out there practicing tricks? All my friends back in the seventies laugh at me because I was the worst trainer in the world. And, <laughs> and, 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 and partly it's because, you know, like in the fall, starting in, um, in, in September, I was involved with all these Harry Letter consumer ski shows that travel across the country from San Francisco, LA, Chicago, Detroit, all the way back to Washington, D.C. 
So for two months, I'd be, you know, doing these ski shows inside an auditorium. And the only skiing we got was on that artificial ski deck. And we would perform uh, to audiences all over the country. Well, my fellow competitors would be out there working their butts off and, and doing the training. And not that I would do that, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the world's worst. But, uh, you know, I, in those days, I probably skied uh, a good part of 200 days a year because I, I taught uh, ski, you know, as soon as we were able to in the wintertime from October on. And then as the ski area is closed now, um, I taught summer ski camps at Whistler. Uh, with the first summer ski camps up there from uh, uh, June until August. And, and I taught thousands of kids up on the glaciers up there. And I, I have to tell you one story that's really been kind of my real claim to fame. You know, other you know, people think that um, uh, freestyle skiing and all that was a claim. Yeah, and that's true. That's a big part of it. But what I like to tell people is this little side story that um, uh, one of uh, my fellow instructors came up to me and said, hey, Wayne, you're in the cycling magazine. And I said, why would I be in a cycling magazine? And I said, well, it says that this one kid came to, to the summer ski camp and uh, he asked you what you did in the summer for training. And you told him that you were riding your 10 speed bike. And, I, and at that time, that's what I did. Yeah. In the summer, I would go out and I'd ride my 10 speed bike, you know, for training, basically. So this kid went back and started to uh, ride the bike. And little did I know that uh, later on, I find out that this 14 year old kid had come up to be a freestyle skier, but he ended up being three time Tour de France champion, Greg LeMond. Wow. And so. <laughs> I I have the honor of saying that I I was the, one of the influences, great influences to Greg LeMond to become a cyclist and to become a three-time Tour de France winner. And now that, so that's cool. I'm, I'm very pr I'm very proud of that. Uh, but you know, and that's really cool. But a uh, sideline of that, I it's, I've run into so many people who said what I've done in skiing has influenced their lives so much in whatever career they are. And, you know, they've taken a lot of what I have uh, uh, shown people and taken it into their own lives and uh, made it part of their own lifestyle. So that, that, that to me is, is very gratifying. But whenever I meet people and tell them, you know, my, my the Wayne Moss story, I have to throw in the Gray Lamont deal. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. Yeah, I, yeah. That's that's like the right there, Angelo. Like, how would we ever know that unless we had Wayne on? <laughs> how about that? <laughs> now yeah, we got to have Greg Lamond on, right? That's right. So what you need to do is, um, if you go onto Greg Lamond's website or his book, the Greg Lamond Complete Book of Cycling, yeah. there's a whole paragraph dedicated to me how I was uh, one of the main influences in his uh, career in cycling. What? And I've had uh, the honor of skiing with Greg several times after, after that. That's that is fantastic. so cool. Yeah. Now, now is Greg a, an avid skier? The, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yes, cool. he, is. he was one of the uh, original members of the Yelp, that private club, the Elso club mm -hmm. in Montana. Yeah. And uh, he got involved with that. And it was, a, you know, a, a property owner, uh, a member of the Yellowstone Club for many, many years. So I actually was uh, had an uh, opportunity to ski with him several times while I was out at the club. Oh, that's cool. God. Yeah. So, and, and tell us about your induction into the U.S. Ski and in, in the Canadian Hall of Fame. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. That that's uh, you know that that's really kind of a neat deal. Um, so I was inducted into the Canadian Ski Hall of Fame in two thousand and nine. And uh, one of the, uh, my fellow uh, ski instructor, uh, uh, freestyle competitors, John Eves, uh, no, no, Peter Judge. Peter Judge had um, uh, nominated me for the Canadian Ski Hall of Fame. And uh, I got inducted into that. Um, 
Mm-hmm. The U.S. Ski Hall of Fame, um, I was inducted into that in 2012. Um, and uh, I, I guess at that time, um, people had already thought I was a, uh, a, an inductee, so there was never any question about that. But then w- one of my other freestyle guys said, wait, you're not in the Freestyle Hall of Fame or in the U.S. Hall of Fame. I'm going to nominate you. And uh, so anyways, I got nominated and I got selected and uh, I was in the class of 2012. So I'm officially a member of the U.S. Ski Hall of Fame. That's cool. That's incredible. I I learned about um, your charitable works too, Wayne. I thought you might want to talk. I know you've done work for cystic fibrosis. Do you want to mention some of the uh, charities Uh, you've done work for? Sure. Sure. And and that's a big part of my career. So um, I got involved with uh, charitable ski events back in about 1984. And the way it all came about was And I know that a lot of athletes face the same thing. After your competitive career, what do you do? What do you do with what you've done? And I know for a while I was searching, you know, um, you know, I've I've done this, uh, you know, uh, in in skiing. But what more can I do? And I was very fortunate enough to, um, again, it goes back to Waterville Valley, where I, I still have a relationship with Waterville as well. Um, but they invited me to come out to do a fundraiser, a celebrity ski event, uh, for the Krista McAuliffe Sabbatical Trust Fund, which Krista McAuliffe was the school teacher who died in the space shuttle. And she was from, uh, Concord, New Hampshire, which is close to Waterville Valley. So they wanted to raise money for the Sabbatical Trust Fund. And so they, uh, the marketing people uh, invited me to come and participate at this event. And so at that event, I met uh, one of the sponsors uh, with American Airlines. And he said, hey, Wayne, I have another event uh, at Crested Beauty in about a month, month and a half. I'd love for you to come out and do that. It's for cystic fibrosis. And I said, oh, okay. I'd love to do it just because you know it's a skiing event. But I had no idea what cystic fibrosis was. Uh, you know, I was just going to go there and ski and be Wayne Wong. And um, anyhow, I when I got there, I realized that uh, it was one of the uh, um, number one killers of children in the United States. And their lifespan was only um, uh, up to 18 years old at that time. And uh, so... Uh, I got involved with that event and I uh, started to help them raise money. And over the course of about 30 years that I was involved with that event, uh, we, uh, I'm proud to say that with that event and other uh, uh, cancer events and stuff, um, I was able to help raise over $40 million for all these different charities that I was involved with. So my, I realized that my real calling in my life um, was yeah, to use my celebrity status as a skier, but to help raise money for all these other charitable events. And so I'm very proud to say that, yeah, my skiing career was great, but my charitable career was even greater. And I, I have to tell you that one of the one of the years we were at um, the celebrity event for cystic fibrosis at, at Vail, they, every year they gave away the uh, Guardian Angel Award, and that was for somebody who had dedicated, uh, you know, uh, whatever to the charity. And that one year they uh, presented the Guardian Angel Award to me. And uh, it probably meant more to me than winning the uh, World Freestyle Championships back in the early days. The fact that, you know, they recognized what I did for cystic fibrosis, and what, what, what it meant to them. I have this beautiful glass angel trophy in my trophy case now. And it sits right there amongst all my other trophies. But it's probably the most uh, profound uh, trophy that I have. It, it really kind of meant more to me because 
of what I was able to do uh, with my skiing skills and my love of skiing and to be able to bring that to um, help people in need. You know, I hate people. I hate you know people who say, "Oh, I want to give back," and, and, but it really is that you know to be able to use what you have as a skill to be able to help other people. I I, I think that to me was a really big part of my ski, skiing career up till now, and I'm still you know still involved in a lot of different things like that. That's super cool. Super cool. And, and I know you, you said you're still involved in a lot of that stuff now. What else is Wayne Wong up to now? I, I did hear something as we were planning the podcast here to, to get a hold of you and connect with some folks that helped us out um, on both sides to connect with each other. You were building a house or is there other things going on? What, what's, what is Wayne Wong up to? Okay. It's not so, affecting being and, and not helping so many people out. What's Wayne Wong doing for himself? So I'm still, I'm still very much involved in skiing. A big part of my life is still in skiing. And about 15 years ago, I met a gentleman named Anton Wilson uh, out of New York. And uh, I've been looking for a, um, the next best, the next greatest thing in skiing since the shape ski. And Anton Wilson came up with this concept of a true suspension ski it, it it is the most um when i skied on it for the first time about 15 years ago i said oh my gosh this is the next step this is what i've been looking for to get us from the conventional ski to the shape ski now we have this true suspension ski so i've been working with anton developing this system and helping him promote it and marketing it and the concept behind this is that uh, it's, a, it's a suspension system that's mounted on top of the ski. If you go to AntonSkis.com, you'll see it. And it's, uh, it, it's called the Anton Suspension System. And uh, it's got these springs that are mounted on the front part of the ski and the back part of the ski. And what these springs do is they uh, load the tip and the tail independently so that when you stand on the ski, the, now the entire ski is loaded from tip to tail. Gives you more stability. It, it takes a lot of the, the work out of it because your forward aft movements on the ski uh, is already there, generated from the spring pushing down uh, and, and allow the ski to just roll over on the edge and, and start to start. So uh, I'm very much involved with that with Anton. And uh, I, I, I really believe that this is the system. Uh, and we've had other ski professionals who have been on the ski and said, holy cow, this is the, the, the next best thing. However, you know, this, the ski industry has been a little bit reluctant to take it on, mainly because they went through that carving phase way too quickly, and they started uh, marketing fatter, wider skis, uh, off-piece skis. So... Uh, you know, their, their take on it was, yeah, your stuff works exactly what you say, Wade, but right now our marketing plans are all on these wider, fatter skis, off piece skis, I think. Yes. So we lost a little bit of traction, but like I said, right now, I'm seeing a little bit more turnaround back to front side skis. You see a lot more of that in the magazine articles and stuff, and they're really emphasizing the carbon thing. So I think. And I hope that uh, what we're doing with this suspension system will catch on and that it'll be more uh, um, available to the general public as it's really see uh, and, and feel what this uh, suspension system can do. So I'm involved with that. I still take clients out to ski um, and I do special ski events. Unfortunately, with COVID last year, I've had to reboot a little bit. I was getting, uh, we were on the way back to help uh, rebrand Waterville Valley uh, and become one of the figureheads back there. Uh, but uh, because of what happened, we have to kind of um, reboot again and go back and, and revisit that. Um, I have a lot of different sponsors that still love to have me on their product. Uh, and I, I, you know, I still love the sport. <laughs> I'm still, that's my main deal. <laughs> that's, Although that's... you mentioned something about building house. Yeah. You know, when I'm not on the slope, 
you know, keep me occupied. Yeah, I, you know, right now I'm building a house. <laughs> <laughs> didn't I? Didn't I see a, uh, a special edition white Wayne Wong sunglasses last year? <laughs> what's going on? Yes, what's, going, what's going on with that? <laughs> okay, uh, okay. So uh, these two guys from Europe contacted me last year, and they're doing these retro style sunglasses. And they said, you know, we want to do a white sunglasses. And the guy that we need is Wayne Wong because the white sunglasses and that style of glasses were his namesake. And, uh, you know, it, it, we've got to get a hold of them. So I, they contacted me and they said, we want to do a special edition signature series white sunglasses with your name on it. I said, how cool is that? That would be great. So um, we, 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 we launched the program last year, and uh, it is available through their website. It's uh, Valon, V-A-L-L-O-N, and uh, you can check it out there. Uh, they're high-end sunglasses. They're just like the ones I wore back in the day when I was competing. Same shape, same color. Um, and uh, I tell you what, uh, my daughter and I, we got off the lift at Deer Valley on Saturday, and the left opera said, "Cool glasses." <laughs> <laughs> the whole retro a, kind of look, you know. It's the same as same as in that poster. It's yeah, the same yeah. like the yeah. mirrored white sunglasses. Angela, right? we yes. need to put on our jean jackets and, and a pair yeah. of those sunglasses at Pro Gym. <laughs> That's right. There you yep. go. Exactly. And people, people from my hometown have been wearing that since 1971. I could just go down <laughs> yeah. there and get it. Hey, Wayne, I, I am. I'm curious where the first pair of white sunglasses came from. Mm. A big bird. I said, I'm curious where the first pair of your white sunglasses came from. Okay, you remember so, that? So, what happened back, uh, back in, uh, I guess, it would be the late 60s? John Claude Keeley was promoting a Keeley sunglasses through CB, C-E-B-E. And they were really cool. Every ski instructor, you know, when we were at our training classes and stuff like that, everybody wanted them, wanted to buy them. And I had a pair. But when I went back to Waterville Valley, uh, they, they, the ski shop there had a white pair like that. I was, oh my gosh, this is cool. So, well, I, I bought a pair of those, and that really became, the, you know, my signature look, the white sunglasses with my black hair and stuff. And I was not sponsored by them. I just loved them and the love of look that uh, it gave me. And uh, so I uh, ended up, I, I bought a, a whole case of them. <laughs> oh, so I would, have, I would sit on them, you know, put them in my jacket, sit on them, break them I'd give them to somebody. And so I, I know that a couple of times I bought like a dozen pairs at a time just to have them with me. But uh, yeah, so that became the signature look for Wayne one of those white uh, CB um, mirrored sunglasses. And so when Valen um, came to me and asked if I would be interested in having a signature sunglass again, I said, yeah, that's cool. And it just helps keep my name out there as well. Uh, I'm very blessed to have my name still have the longevity that I've had in this case since you know, 1971. You know, how many years is that? 40 years now? Yeah. Shows the impact. Shows the impact. The Godfather. The yeah, Godfather of freestyle. And, and um, <laughs> what what has been wh – where's the coolest place you went to ski for you? Like the coolest kind of I, – I got to ski here. Um, You know, I have a lot of great places that I've skied. Uh, you know, I, I love the whole heli ski experience. I think that every skier who, who's, who loves to power ski, that is a, uh, a, a, a thing you got to do at, one, at least once. Um, so I, I, I was fortunate to go out and ski with Mike Wigley several times. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away last year. Um, but heli skiing is a great experience. Um, one of the most unique experiences is uh, going to the Yellowstone Club. It's a, a private club in Montana. And it, you know, it only has so many members there. And there's really not that many members. And I'll remember one of the first times skiing there. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing. 
Um, I'm riding on this lift. It's about three quarters of a mile long. And I'm on a, a, a four pack chair all by myself. And I'm riding up this lift at 1030 in the morning. There's a foot of powder out there. I go up and I'm riding and I don't see a single soul. Not one person has skied down under the lift that I could see. And I am the only person that I saw riding the lift. So in a, so from a unique experience, you could say you were there by yourself, skiing the whole mountain by yourself. So that, that, that was kind of a cool thing. But, you know, people ask you, what was the best? Can you remember your best ski run ever? And I, I, I do have one. And uh, it was at Mike Weekly Heli Ski uh, several years ago. It was late in the afternoon, about 3 o'clock or so. The sun starting to set down. And we had uh, a group of about 12 people. And we're skiing about a 5,000 vertical run. And it's a very undulating uh, uh, run that goes down and deep into this valley. And then up of this valley, the other side of the valley mountains comes straight up again. So all you all you see on your horizon is this whole vast uh, mountain range, jaggedy peaks covered with snow and highlighted with uh, sunlight accents. So I wait for my group to head down ahead of me. So we have a, a lead guide and a tail guide. So the tail guide and I are the last ones. And so we wait for a while, just taking it all in. And the sun is at the perfect angle. It's about a foot, foot and a half of powder. And um, I start down. And I go over this roll. And I don't see my group. And I continue on down. And now we ski now farther and farther. And I realize now that when we get down to the bottom, I skied 5,000 vertical feet in a foot of powder and not see a soul until I got to the heli pickup site down in the bottom of the valley. It was the most uh, 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 spiritual, I would say, run that I've had just because you you think you're all by yourself in this huge mountain range with, you know, uh, powder snow and sunshine and you don't see or hear another person for about 15, 20 minutes till you get down to the very bottom where the helicopter is waiting to pick you up. And, uh, yeah, that, that to me, you know, was, uh, burned into my mind. That to me was probably the best run I've ever had in my life so far. That, that's awesome. Is there, is there some place that you think might match that or beat it that you have on the bucket list? You go, I still need to ski this place. You know, there's several ski areas in the United States, big, you know, like that I've not been to like Telluride. I'd, I'd love to go to Telluride. Uh, you know, some places up there in you know, Red Lodge, uh, Targhee. Uh, you know, so there, there's a there's a lot of places that I still would like to visit and, and see what they're all about. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm sure I'll get a chance sometime. But you know, and I do like you know like like, like little places like Neshoba Valley. They're, they're a blast to go to. Yeah, they're just as fun. You know, you, when you have all these little kids that want to, uh, you know, get out and ski with you and learn tricks, it's yeah. fun. So here's a question. Uh, have Have you ever done any joint stuff with Glenn Plake? Because the you were, you know, the both of you remind me a lot of each other in terms of out there with, with folks and doing camps and just promoting the sport as a whole yeah. picture. I, I love Glenn. He, he is really one of the true promoters of our sport. And he, he does so much. And he does a great job at it. You know, and he's really into, you know, getting the kids out there and working with the grassroots and stuff. And I've, I've done some uh, different uh, promotions with him uh, around the country. And we get along really, really well. And, uh, you know, fortunately, a lot of times our paths don't cross, but when they do, it's amazing. We had such a great time together. I think the last time we did a deal uh, together was at Mammoth uh, about four years ago, three or four years ago, when we were raising money for the community college or community school down there. And uh, ski with a bunch of kids and a bunch of locals. And, um, 
Yeah, and we were doing tricks. <laughs> Glenn yeah. loves to do tricks. <laughs> yes, he does. But that's why the thing, it's like, you know, when you ski with Glenn, I've, had, I've been able to do that a couple of times the last few years. And he, he loves to show the ballet tricks. I mean, he goes back to those roots and, and, and I love watching him do it, man. It's crazy. Some of the stuff where he can put his feet. <laughs> I know Angela you know, likes it because Angela loves that skateboard kind oh, of feel. He, you know, he, Glenn, Glenn came to Seven Springs a couple of times when I was uh, a kid. And I remember we had this new uh, double black diamond slope that was unveiled called Goosebumps. And we and it was a little bit steeper than the stuff that we had before that. And, um, you know, it, looking back, looking at it now, it's not that much of a hill. But I remember Glenn rolling to the top of with a pair of 223s. And we were like, how in the world is he going to ski that, those big skis on our tight little bumps? So he just got ahead of steam and like bounced off of six of them. And he was at the bottom. We were like, oh, that didn't, didn't think of doing it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what, though? Oh, I tell you, one of the things I really enjoyed was skiing 200 centimeter skis in the old style models. And you could not do it, you know, in today's shape, uh, the way that models are shaped. Um, back, but back in the '60s and, and early in the '70s, early '70s, we had bigger, rounder models and stuff like that. And yeah. skiing a uh, nice flexing 200 centimeter skis in the bumps and getting the flex and you know um, counter counter flex out of the bumps. And that's a, a great sensation. And, you know, and that's where my technique really evolved in, in mogul skiing, skiing that type of bump, that type of ski back then. And, uh, you know, I guess one of the last times I really kind of ski bumps hard was a day we, we skied with Johnny Mosley uh, and Plake and a bunch of the young mogul skiers at Heavenly in, in that mo in Greg Stubbs movie, The uh, Fistful of Moguls. And uh, I was on a pair of 180s at that time. And uh, that, that was a blast skiing there. And I had all these young bucks, young gunslingers chasing <laughs> me down through the moguls. And that, that was really cool. So if you get a chance, check out this one of moguls. There's a little segment uh, with myself and John Clendenin, uh and Johnny Mosley the year before he won the Olympics skiing the moguls at him. That's so cool. Hey, um, we, I, I just have to thank you, Wayne, for, for jumping on with us. Uh, it's a dream for Angelo and I, Angelo and I kind of were texting back and forth and, uh, it was Angelo's, uh, how did you phrase it? Angelo, it was your lifetime goal of the podcast was to have Wayne Wong on. I said, and, I said, you know, clearly we're at the celebrity level that a guy like Wayne would <laughs> die to come on our show. So let's get yeah. it. <laughs> thank god we know some other people and i showed oh, someone right. that text and uh yes and, yeah. and when we, we were able to connect and it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure and um it's so cool to hear you talk about the history and all the things you've accomplished and it, it's uh you should be proud of them it's really amazing and and all of the stuff you've done for folks with cancer and cystic fibrosis and all those things that's amazing to be able to you know from your ski celebrity to bring it to uh, to help folks is awesome. And um, we want to thank some of our friends out there for helping us keep the podcast going to have some great folks on like Wayne Wong and thank Blizzard Technica and Nick's boot fitting over at Mount Snow. And maybe we'll have Wayne come out and uh, ski with us. Maybe, maybe not this winter, but maybe next winter, Angela, and we'll, we'll do it in person live somewhere where we're skiing at an event. That. That's right. I would I would love to do that. And anytime you guys want to bring me back on, I'd love to, you know, I love yeah. it. I'm very passionate and I love the sport. And anytime I can share that passion with anybody else, uh, that's a big deal for me. That's cool. We would love to have you back on. Absolutely. I know we have lots more to ask and lots more stories we'd like to listen to. Right, Angelo? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, anytime. So. Anytime. Give me a call anytime. You got my number now. Yeah. Yes, we do. Angelo is really cool. He, he sent me a he sent me a, a shot of his phone. He's like, "How cool is it to get a text from Wayne Wong?" <laughs> so, so we definitely can say we have Wayne Wong on speed dial now. I don't think many right. people can say that. So we're pretty excited, and uh, we will definitely be inviting you back on. And, and now I think it's going to be Angelo's and my lifelong goal is to be able to ski with you. So that's what we're looking forward to. Right, so let's make right. it happen. Let's make All righty. Thank you very much. Wow. Thanks, everybody out there for listening to Spend the Fall Line with Chaos and Company.